this is a revision video for P2 energy transfer by heating uh, for GCSE combined science um, AQA trilogy. So first of all we need to think about um, conduction and conduction is a process um, of kind of transferring um, thermal energy and we usually think about conduction what well, happens best in solids. So if we remember that solids we represent with particles that are very close together, touching in a um, kind of regular formation. If I was to apply a heat source at one end, then what would happen is these particles would start vibrating more. And because the particles are so close together, because they're touching, because they're in this formation, the vibrations get passed along to the other end of the substance okay so we should know already probably from year seven or year eight that metals are very good conductors metals are the best conductors okay um, and non-metals are the best insulators metals So an insulator being something that doesn't pass on this thermal energy very easily. Um, in terms of non-metals, you need to usually be able to give some examples of non-metals. So you could give an example of plastic. Wool is something that often comes up as an insulator in this topic. Or something called fiberglass, which is kind of very thin strands of glass which uh, are spun together and it looks quite like wool um, but like I say it's made out of very very thin glass. So we need to think about properties of these materials and there's something called thermal conductivity. Thermal conductivity. Okay and this is a key word that you need to be able to use and you need to be able to recognise. And all that thermal conductivity means is the ability to conduct heat. So if something has a high thermal conductivity, then what this means is it's good at conducting heat, and so there is more energy transferred every second. Okay, if there's something that's got a low thermal conductivity, that means there's less energy that's transferred every second. So if we look back at what we know about conductors, what this tells us, what we should hopefully be able to see, so conductors will have a high thermal conductivity because they can transfer lots of energy every second. And insulators will have a low thermal conductivity because they don't transfer very much energy every second. So sometimes you're asked to explain why a material, why you would choose a certain material as an insulator. So you might say, I would pick wool as my insulator because it has a low thermal conductivity. So it doesn't transfer very much energy every second. Okay, so we could write something about that. So if we wanted to reduce energy transfers, so reducing energy transfers, We would want to have a material that has a low thermal conductivity so is an insulator and we would want it to be as thick as possible So either as thick as possible or lots of layers. 
So you could think about this. When you get cold, so if you go outside and it's snowing or it's icy, you want to reduce the energy that's being transferred from your body out to the air because you want to keep the energy that your body is, uh, the thermal energy that your body is generating, you want to keep close to you so that you stay warm. And we do that by putting either on a big thick coat or by putting on layers. So you would put a t-shirt and a long sleeve top and a jumper or a cardigan, and then you'd put on a jacket. So you're either going to be putting on, well, you're going to be putting on something that has a low thermal conductivity. So you put wool, or maybe you've got a jacket, like a fleece jacket, or maybe you've got a coat that's got feathers inside of it. If it's a down coat, all of those things have a low thermal conductivity or trap air inside of them, which has a low thermal conductivity. And you're either putting on lots of layers or having a really thick jumper or jacket because then that is going to reduce the energy that is transferred from your body to the air outside. So another thing that um, you need to know about, so bringing all of this stuff together, how you normally get asked questions about this is by thinking about um, a house or a building. So if you've got a house, so you're going to need to forgive my terrible art skills. So let's just draw a quick, quick house. Okay, so if we think about our house, where are we going to lose energy from? Well, we're likely to lose energy from the windows, from the roof, and through the walls. Okay, so we need to make sure that we are insulating those places, the roof, the walls and the windows, so that we're reducing how much energy is being transferred from in the house to the outside. So think back to when we did P1 and when we did about efficiency. So efficiency was how much energy is usefully transferred. When you put the heating on in your house, you the useful energy is um, the thermal store of the inside of your house, of the air that is inside of the um, of the house itself. Okay, you don't want to be heating up the atmosphere that is outside the house because otherwise that's wasted, and that is going to um, it's going to waste money more than anything else. So you need to know about what we do to reduce these energy transfers. So the first one, um, if we think about the roof then you have what is called loft insulation. Okay, so the loft is the space that is kind of in the roof of the house. And this is usually made out of fiberglass. So remembering from um, uh, our bit about conduction, that fiberglass is um, a good insulator. So these really thin strands of fiber, often it's pink or yellow and it looks really fluffy and it's put into, um, either into the roof, um, into the kind of slope of the roof, or sometimes it's put onto the kind of floor of the loft. It depends on um, on your how your loft is insulated. Okay, um, it's quite it's the stuff that's quite itchy if you touch it, so don't touch it. Um, so that's the first thing that happens. So you have this fiberglass up here. In your windows, one of the things that we do is we have what is called double glazing. Okay. So we can think about what does this word mean? Well, double usually means two, or does mean two. Um, and this is where each window has two panes of glass. Okay. So two panes of glass. And then inside the glass, it usually has dry air. So it's had all of the moisture and everything taken out of it. Or sometimes it's a vacuum and that means that there's no gas in there at all. Um, and the reason that it has this is because dry air isn't very good at conducting. So you, you, you will reduce the amount of thermal energy that is conducted through this little section here. Okay. Sometimes it's a vacuum, which means that there's no um, gas there at all. So you're not going to be able to let um, energy transfer by conduction or convection. Um, there'll be a little bit of something called radiation, but, but we'll learn about that in year 11. And then onto the walls. So the walls, we could have thicker bricks. That would work, okay? We could have thicker bricks, and that, that is what's done sometimes. Um, you also sometimes have um, 
foil between the radiator and the wall. So think about in your house, it's a radiator that's actually going to be um, putting out the heat into the house. So you've got foil between the radiator and the wall. And what this does is it reflects the heat back into um, the room rather than it being conducted into um, through the brickwork. So it means that the, the shiny radiator reflects it back into the room. So sometimes that's what happens, that stops it from being transferred to the bricks in the first place. And then sometimes you have what is called cavity wall insulation. Okay, and this is a little bit like double glazing. So some, some walls are called cavity walls, and a cavity just means like a hole or a gap or a space. So if we imagine that these are our brick walls, So you'll have two layers of bricks with a bit of a gap in between. And so what happens is they kind of pump like a foam type thing that goes in between, which means that it reduces, so it pumps a material into the gap. And it fills this space with a material that has a low thermal conductivity, so it doesn't conduct very well. And then that means that more of the energy or it, it reduces um, how much thermal energy is moved through the wall. <clears throat> so the last bit of this topic um, that you've learnt about is specific heat capacity. So there was another video that I made that gives a bit more detail about this. So it's just going to be a little bit of a summary. So you need to know the definition of specific heat capacity. So it's the amount of energy needed to change the temperature of one kilogram of a substance or a material or a thing by one degree Celsius, okay? So <clears throat> let's just go through the um, practical and we'll, we'll just go over this bit a bit more. So we've got our substance and our substance is going to be a, um, a block of metal. Okay, so this is a metal. So for example, copper, that's a common metal that we would work out the specific heat capacity of. So um, we need to raise the temperature or change the temperature of it. And we do that by having an electric heater. Okay, and we need to measure the temperature change, so we use a thermometer. Okay, We need to make the electric heater work, so it needs to be connected to a power source, but we also need to work out the amount of energy. And we work out the amount of energy by using a piece of equipment called a joule meter. Okay, So joule, remember, is the unit of energy, so a joule meter measures energy. And then that goes to a power supply. Okay, when we're back in school, we will do this practical, so don't worry too much about it, but um, it is something that you need to know about. So we've got a power supply giving electrical energy. The joule meter is counting how many joules are being transferred to the electric heater. The electric heater, once it's on, is going to start heating this metal up, and the thermometer is going to measure how much the temperature changes by. To make sure that all of the energy or as much of the energy as possible is going to the actual piece of metal what we normally do is we surround the block by insulation and this makes our results more accurate because it means that 
rather than the energy going to the meta block and then being conducted to the surroundings, most of that energy is going to stay in. So we're reducing the amount of energy that's being transferred to the surroundings so that it's being used usefully to heat up the metal block. Okay, so you do get given the equation for specific heat capacity. Okay, so you'll get given this in your um, in your test paper. So it's energy is equal to mass times the specific heat capacity, which I'm going to write here as SHC because I can't bother to write the whole thing, times the temperature change. Okay, so let's remember that energy is measured in joules, mass is measured in kilograms, temperature change is measured in degrees Celsius. And you do need to know the unit for specific heat capacity. And I'll write it here, it is joules per kilogram degrees Celsius. Okay, so if you are asked to work out the energy or any of the other kind of um, quantities, just do the normal method that we do where you um, highlight the information that's in the question, you write out the equation, you substitute in the value, so write out the equation here, and then write down the values underneath each one. If you need to rearrange it, do it then, and then write down the final answer. Okay, so that's just a quick summary of uh, the energy transfer by heating topic.